Many Westerners argue that the implementation of Sharia in society would be an abuse to human rights. The banning of individual rights and the enforcement of punishing behaviors are some arguments made by opponents of Sharia. While others claim the implementation of Sharia law would solve societal problems through the abolishment of man-made laws such as human rights, the debate tonight is whether there is a place for Islamic law in Western democracy and how it would help or damage the West. Thank you for joining us this evening here on ABN. I'm Chris Conway, and you're watching Debate Night. We have two special guests debating this question tonight. Would Sharia help the West? I'm honored to introduce David Wood, who will argue that Sharia law would not help the West. David is a teaching fellow in philosophy, a former atheist. David became a Christian after investigating the historical evidence for Jesus' resurrection. He's been studying Islam since 1994, and is a co-director of Acts 17 Apologetics Ministry. David has been in more than two dozen formal debates with Muslims. I'm also honored to introduce Anjem Chowdhury. Anjem is the former UK head of Mohad Al Mahad Jareem. Probably not saying that right. Sorry. He is a lecturer in Sharia law, and he's also the chair of the Society of Muslim Lawyers. We will hear from each speaker an opening statement two rebuttals, two sets of crossfire, and a closing statement. I'll notify each of the speakers when there are 60 seconds left on the clock. In fact, you will hear this sound. That sound, it's something like that. You'll hear that sound when we're about one minute left. Let's try that again. We'll play that sound again. So at that point, each of you, just so you know, you'll have one minute left to finish that particular statement, whether it's your opening statement or a rebuttal or whatever it happens to be. And uh, forgive me if I'm, if I'm a little rude to try to cut you off. We want to just keep track of our time. So I'm not trying to be rude, but I might have to be abrupt as we move forward. So just keep an eye on that and an ear listening for that tone. You'll have one minute after that point. We will then conclude the formal debate of the, of the formal part of the debate and over the phone lines, open the phone lines for you, the audience, to call in. The studio number is 248. 416-1300. So please make a note of that. In fact, if you're sitting down to check this show out on the internet, which is www.abnsat.com, just maybe uh, uh, call a friend, call an enemy, call someone you know uh, that would like to participate in this program, not only to watch, but certainly toward the end of the program. Again, we'll give you an opportunity to call in. That number again, 248-416-1300. Again, the question for tonight's debate is, would Sharia help the West? At this time, I'd like to turn it over to you, Anjem, for your opening statements. You now have six minutes. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh for all of the Muslims, and good evening for all of the non-Muslims. Indeed, every human being in this life wants to gain benefit and to prevent harm, and they want this not only uh, in this life, but those people who believe in a hereafter as well to enter into the paradise of God. There is no doubt that Islam is the perfect way of life and ideology and religion for mankind. The word Sharia in Arabic means an oasis. And in fact, as far as we are concerned in Islam, it means the Islamic way of life. And the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the mercy for mankind. And indeed the word Islam is submission to the commands of the Creator in this life. I want to begin by saying that if you look at the Quran, the inimitability of the Quran, the historical, the scientific, the linguistic, if you like, miracle, then you will find that it must have come from the one who created mankind and sent all of the prophets to God. The conflict between man following his own desires and those people who submit to God is as old as Adam alayhi salam, Adam alayhi salam, and will continue until the day of judgment. All of the prophets of God, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and the final messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa among many others, they 
called the societies in which they live to submit to the divine law and away from their own whims and desires and worshipping idols and their own desires and anything other than the divine law. I want to say to you that there is no doubt that when we look at the society in the West nowadays, it is something that must have Islam as its solution. We can see, for example, that the biggest industries in the West nowadays are industries like pornography, gambling, alcohol, drug abuse. Our children do not have any kind of objective or um, you know, ambition in their life. Not only that, we have industries like cosmetics, uh, Hollywood, fashion, which exploit the instincts and the desires of human beings for monetary gain. If I give you some statistics about the society in which David Woods himself lives and is supposedly the bastion of freedom and democracy before we begin to see the benefit of the Sharia and how Sharia will eradicate this. We can see, for example, in America, there are 5,329 honor killings in 1990. FBI said more than half of those by the husband and the boyfriend, women killed in America by their own family. If you look, for example, the CNN specials transcript, Thieves of Childhood, Dr. Jean Abel estimates between 1% and 5% of the population of America molest their own children. Two-thirds of all prisoners convicted of rape or sexual assault committed their crime against a child. That is the BGS survey of state prison inmates in 1991. Not only that, we can see of all of the nations around the world, the largest number of downloads of child pornography happened more than 50% in America then 14.9% in Russia, then 11.7% in Japan, and so on. Not only that, we can see that this corruption is manifest in all sections of society. Not even the church, if you like, is bereft of this. Rather, if you look at the Catholic pedophile, uh, if you like, um, uh, fiasco in America, we can see that from 1950 until 2002, over 4,392 priests were accused of abusing children. The victims... 5.8% under 7, 16% from 8 to 10, 50.9% from 11 to 14, 27.3% from 15 to 17, 81% male, 19% female. As if that was not enough, 4 in 10 nuns in America, Catholic nuns, have experienced sexual abuse. So we see of 85,000 85, nuns, they experience sexual trauma. That is 40% of all of the nuns. This is according to nun stories. Uh, that you find NCR, the 1st of 15, 1999. Not only that, in their quest for, if you like, equality, we can see that there is no equality in America whatsoever. In fact, in the army, they say 90% of women serve, serving are sexually harassed by their own men. And they say that, uh, in fact, 90% of rapes are not even reported. And this is astounding, if you like, statistic, even, their, even in their own, if you like, uh, um, uh, institution, such as the army. Uh, we can go on in education, one in four, one in five at college, women experience a complete or attempted rape in your college life. Every two minutes, someone in America, somebody is sexually assaulted. This is from RAIN 2000 National uh, uh, Crime Victimization Survey. One out of every six American women have been the victim, victim of attempted or completed rape. In pedophilia, more than half of all rapes of women occur under the age of 18, 22% under the age of 12. In uh, 2000, nearly 88,000 children in the United States experienced sexual abuse. And we see 50,000 women and children trafficked in the U.S. for prostitution. And I can go on and on. I have many statistics and many things. But I just want to say to you that uh, when you look at Islam, in 1,302 years, only 60 reported rapes. In 1,302 years, only less than 200 convictions for theft. Less than 100 people stoned to death for adultery. We can see that there's no comparison economically, socially, judicially. Islam would eradicate all of the corruption of Western civilization, pornography, gambling, all of this exploitation. There are more people killed in America every year than there are dying in Iraq and Afghanistan. They're killing their own people more than others. We are talking about an anarchy situation. Islam would be a mercy for America. It would eradicate America of all of the corruption, all of the degradation, the anarchy in which you live. Islam is the only solution for America. We can see throughout history, Islam always provided the solution. It treats men and women as human beings, does not allow exploitation whatsoever. You cannot buy a tin of beans in America without having a naked woman on the cover. There is no comparison whatsoever from equality to church to pedophilia to education in every aspect of life. Islam okay, is superior. That's it. Yaulu, wala, yutla, thank you, Anja. Uh, thank you for that opening statement. Again, I apologize for having to be abrupt there, but we're going to move on. We are six, your six minutes are up. We are now resetting the clock. And David, you at this point have six minutes. You now may begin your opening statement. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Chris, and greetings to Anjum. It's, uh, it's nice to debate a Muslim who actually 
uh, believes in Muhammad's teachings rather than the watered down, whitewashed Walt Disney version of Islam that we're all so familiar with here in the West. Uh, as we can see from Anjum's opening statement, one of the most uh, common tactics of Muslim apologists is to point out some problem or difficulty in Western society and then to say, Islam can fix that. Islam's got what you need. So convert to Islam and your life and society will get better. Now, I'm willing to grant that we face difficulties here in the West, um, but that's true of every country in the world, including the Muslim countries, and of every society in human history. Uh, anytime you've got lots of people trying to live together and work together, uh, it's going to be a struggle. And the question for us is whether Islam is the solution to our troubles, and I haven't seen uh, any evidence for that yet. Uh, in the West, we have more of a scientific approach to government. In America, for instance, the, the founding fathers looked to the past, they looked to the data, and they put together a list of the greatest sources of human misery, things like uh, minorities being oppressed, um, rulers abusing their subjects, people not being able to speak their minds or freely practice their religions, and so on. Uh, based on this data, they designed a government that would guard against these obstacles to human happiness and progress. But they knew that uh, more problems would arise, and so they, they set up a system, Congress and the courts, uh, to deal with these problems as they arise. And using this method, we've been, a, we've been able to overcome some of the most difficult trials societies have to face. Slavery was a problem, uh, and we dealt with it. Women not being able to vote was a problem, and we dealt with it. Um, racial segregation was a problem, and, uh, and we dealt with it. We dealt with these problems within our system, and history shows uh, that we are able to overcome tremendous difficulties. Is our system perfect? No. But we've become the world's uh, most powerful and prosperous nation, uh, which means we must be doing something right. Now, Anjum believes that Sharia would somehow make the West better. My question is, uh, better for whom? Would Sharia make the West better for women? No. Women wouldn't be able to vote since women are stupid, according to Muhammad, and since there's uh, no democracy in Islam anyway. Uh, Sharia would bring back polygamy, along with the unfair, unequal treatment that comes with it. Men would be able to beat their wives into submission under Sharia. Men would be able to have sex with little girls under Sharia. Men would be able to rape their captives and slave girls under Sharia. So women would obviously uh, suffer under Islamic law, uh, which means that it would be bad for more than half of the population. Would Sharia make the West, uh, make, uh, make the West better for Christians? Uh, no, Christians are commanded to preach the gospel, which we cannot do under Sharia, nor can we build uh, new churches, repair old churches, or even wear crosses. <laughs> uh, Christians are second-class citizens under Sharia. We have to uh, give up our seats when Muslims enter the room. We have to let Muslims use our places of worship as hotels, and we have to pay a tax to Muslims in order to avoid being butchered. Would Sharia make the West better for Jews? No. In theory, Jews would be reduced to dimmy status, just like Christians, uh, but in reality, I think they'd be slaughtered the way that the Kareza Jews were slaughtered by Muhammad. Uh, well, not all of the Kareza Jews were slaughtered, only males who had reached puberty. The women and children became the slaves of Muslims, and that's not something that Jews would like to see repeated. Uh, would Sharia make the West better for Hindus or Buddhists or atheists or agnostics? No, they wouldn't even get the dimmy option. The message to them would be convert or die. Would Sharia make uh, the West better for the constantly growing number uh, of apostates, people who've left Islam? Would Sharia improve their lives? No, they'd be executed. Uh, would Sharia make the West better for people who like to think for themselves, people who like to speak their minds, people who like to have public debates on issues such as the one before us? No, Islam doesn't allow criticism. Uh, people like me would be killed. So Anjum and I couldn't even have this debate under Sharia. And which version of Sharia are we supposed to adopt? Is it the Sharia of the Sunnis? If so, would this be good for the Shias? Or are we adopting the Sharia of Shia Muslims? And how would Anjum and his friends like that? And would either version of Sharia be good for, say, the Ahmadis, uh, who, who are routinely beaten and butchered in Muslim countries? Of course not. So how exactly is Sharia going to help the West? Who's going to benefit from the spread of Islamic law? Well, I suppose if a man is just dying to have sex with, with a little girl or wants to have four wives or wants to beat his wives into submission or wants to capture some women and rape them, Sharia can definitely help him accomplish his goals. Uh, if someone wants to oppress people and kill people and torture people and rob people and enslave people and chop off people's fingers and hands and feet and heads, uh, Sharia can most certainly help.
Uh, but these aren't the people we want to help in the West. These are people we want to put in jail, Anjum. Uh, it turns out then that Sharia is a legal system that promotes and justifies immorality and inequality and intolerance and injustice and violence and cruelty and abuse and oppression. Uh, but this sort of legal system will never help, uh, will never have any society uh, or culture, let alone a society of free men and women, uh, men and women who believe that we have certain inalienable rights and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Muslims have had 14 centuries to show us that Sharia works. Muslims make up close to a quarter of the world's population and have a majority in 47 countries. The more these countries try to implement elements of Sharia, the more miserable people are and the more people want to leave. Even Muslims are fleeing Muslim countries. They're climbing over each other in order to get to the West. And here Anjum is telling Christians and Jews and Hindus and atheists that we should adopt Sharia when we can see that even the people who believe in Muhammad can't stand living under this brutal, backward, thank you, thank and barbaric teachings. Thank you, David. Very, very, very good. Uh, we're at the six-minute mark for each of you now. At this point, uh, we will give Anjum. Uh, we're setting the clock for five minutes. We will give you an opportunity for a five-minute rebuttal, and you may start now. Thank you. Yes, I think the only thing that we can say about uh, what David Wood said is that he's completely wrong on every single fact, and I can go, go through them one after the other. When he talks about um, uh, Islam does not fix problems, let me tell you something. For over 800 years, the Sharia was implemented in Spain. Before the Muslims came there, they were living in stone hovels with a hole in the roof. They were covered in soot. They never washed. They used to hand out animal furs from generation to generation. There was an overpowering stench. Islam built the first uh, street lights, pavements, hospitals, libraries, over 900 baths, over 400,000 books in the main library in Cordoba. In fact, there was an equivalent of 50 books in Paris at that time, over 200,000 homes, half a million places of worship, 90 public baths, we could go on and on. There was no sewage system in Europe, by the way, until about 100 odd years ago. Spain had that over 100, if you like, over a millennium ago. Not only that, you see, he's talking about uh, uh, that when you have a lot of people, then obviously you're going to have problems. This is rubbish. I have a UN document comparing different countries. Let me tell you about America. In Egypt in 2008, 747 uh, robberies. In Morocco, 23,269. In Sudan, 3,017. In Canada, 32,281. How many do you think it were in America? Maybe 40,000? There were 441,859. That is what you call anarchy. Let's forget about the robbery. Let's go to rape. Rape is even defined. This is your own statistics, not mine. In Egypt, 87 in 2008. In Morocco, 1,130. In America, 89,000. You are living in an anarchy system. And he talks about, he talks about you eradicated slavery. In a, America must be the only country in the world if you're black and you get a job. That is great. You actually have some progress. Let me tell you about slavery. Letter from King Leopold II of Belgium, 1883. Evangelize the niggers. Yes, that's right, the niggers. So that they stay forever in submission to the white colonialists. So they never revolt against the restraints they are undergoing. Recite every day, happy are those who are weeping because the kingdom of God is for them. That is less than 150 years ago. Pope John Paul II, Archbishop of Canterbury, William, uh, Ron William expressed remorse for the church's role in slave trade. And he talks about women. Let me tell you about women. Martin Luther, one of the founders of your civilization, 1483, I think, to 1546 he was. He said, if the women become tired or even die, it doesn't matter because they can die in childbirth. That's what they're there for. Saint Eugene of Hippo. I don't know if he's related to the hippopotamus. What is the difference whether it is a wife or a mother? She's still Eve, the temptress that we must be aware of, of any, any woman. I fail to see what use a woman can be to a man if one excludes the function of bearing children. And you can see, you know, McFarland, uh, the great historian, he said, nine million women, men, and children were murdered in the name of the patriarchal God. That is your history in the church. He hasn't said anything about his statistics, by the way, because he likes to, uh, he likes to quote misfacts facts about Islam, and he wants to cover up. I'm talking about current day America and even your history. Tell me your facts if you got them. And this is all in the name of peace, universal love, and so on. Let's have a look at some more. The motto of the French Renaissance when they rose up against this oppression was hang the last king with the intestines of the last priest. <laughs> I wonder what the church were doing to deserve something like that. In, uh, in 1492, when you expelled 300,000 Jews, where do you think they ran? You think they went to America? They ran to the Muslims. The Ottoman Empire, they sent ships to rescue them from the carnage that the Christians and the Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand were meeting out to them, to Turkey, North Africa, Morocco. You don't have any kind of uh, facts whatsoever. You don't have a finger on me, young man, because basically you're living in anarchy. The, it would be a blessing for this world to eradicate America from the face of the map and to bring the Sharia, I tell you that. 
And when you talk about children, did you know, for example, in the Vatican, and as they say, do as the Romans when you're in Rome, the age of consent is 12 years old. Did you know that? That is Article 3311 of the Zanar Delhi Code, 1889. And uh, obviously, if you have a relationship of dependence with a teacher or someone like that, then it's about 13 or 14. But nevertheless, what did you say? Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, give unto God what is God's. You can't make up your mind what the age of consent is. At least we know, because the divine uh, law tells us exactly what it is. I tell you something, Islam would eradicate all of the problems that you face within society, judicially, economically, socially. And, uh, you know, when you talk about how many people killed, I don't think Hiroshima and Nagasaki were done by the Muslims. And over 100,000 people killed in the first week in 2003 in Iraq. How many hundreds of thousands have been killed by the Akabi bombing in Afghanistan? I think when you talk about your system, your system is corrupt. You are butchers. You are murderers around the world. You are killing your own citizen and abusing them and raping them more than anyone else is doing around the world. That is not a system for mankind. That is a system which belongs in the, tr belongs in the trash bin of history. Islam will elevate you. Islam gives the fetus rights, the right of inheritance. You were, you, you, for the woman and the man, there were chattels. Islam 1,400 years ago, Islam okay. gave the right of inheritance. Okay, thank you very much. And now we will uh, allow David Wood for his five-minute rebuttal as we get closer to our first break. And the clock is set. David, go right ahead, please. Well, wow. Anjum uh, again says that Islam will solve all of our problems. And the only evidence I caught was that uh, Islam did really well in Spain about a thousand years ago. Well, Anjum, I'd like to see how Islam is working out for the world today. He says I have no statistics, and I wasn't going to bring this up, but since he wants some statistics, um, the Gender Equality and Social Institutions Report from the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, that's long, um, but they did an evaluation of uh, over 100 countries in the world. Here were the criteria. They're looking at women's rights and the difference between men's rights and women's rights, and they came up with a list based on the following criteria. Equal opportunities for education and employment, laws to protect women from physical violence, equal rights under the law regarding ownership of property, guardianship right to their own children, so do women get to guard their own children in case of divorce, uh, son preference, our sons pre uh, preferred over, daughter, uh, over daughters, equal access to divorce rights, uh, percentage of women married and divorced by age 16. So based on all of these criteria, um, they put together a list of where women um, are suffering most in the world, where their rights uh, are, uh, are, are, are protected and where their rights uh, are routinely violated. What they found was that out of the 102 countries evaluated, 11 of the bottom 12, 11 of the worst 12 were Muslim majority countries. Now, is that a coincidence? Is it a coincidence that all of the countries that are at the top of the list that have the greatest level of equality between men and women, uh, the greatest level of protection for women's rights, are all Western countries or countries at, at least far away from the Muslim world? Is it a coincidence that the countries that have the greatest violations of women's rights and the greatest disparity between the level of men and the level of women, uh, the worst of them are Muslim countries, 11 of the bottom 12? That's a correlation. Uh, but it's not the only correlation we can look at. Anjum wants some statistics. The 2010 Legatum Prosperity Index, this measures the overall happiness of a country based on things like how satisfied they are uh, with their government, how, how satisfied they are with the prosperity of the country, their final financial situation, how happy they are in their country. Let me give you the top 10 list, the happiest, overall happiest countries in the world. Number one, Norway, then Denmark, Finland, Australia, New Zealand, Sweden, Canada, Switzerland, Netherlands, and the United States. Notice, uh, notice something significant about those top 10. No Muslim countries. Let's keep going, though. Engine wants some statistics. Uh, number 11, Ireland, then Iceland, United Kingdom, Austria, Germany, Belgium, Singapore, Japan, France, Hong Kong. You're getting out of the West now. Uh, you're getting outside of the list, places like Japan and Hong Kong. Uh, but what don't you have anywhere on the top 20 list of the happiest countries in the world? No Muslim countries. Let's keep going. Slovenia, Taiwan, Spain, Czech Republic, Italy, Portugal, South Korea, Uruguay, Poland. Finally, at number 30, we have the United Arab Emirates, a country that's more and more starting to copy the ways of the West. So what do we have here in the top 30? You have one Muslim country in the list of the happiest countries in the world. Um, and uh, it's a country that's starting to act like Western countries. You have to go much further down the list in order to get to some, uh, to some real hardcore Muslim countries. 
so number 70, you have Indonesia. Number 74, Jordan. Number 80, Turkey. 83, Syria. 89, Egypt. 92, Iran. 100, Sudan. 105, Yemen. Uh, part of the heart of the Muslim world there. 109, Pakistan. So Andrew is complaining about how awful it is here in the West, and it's just this, this horrible, horrible place, and yet uh, the evidence shows otherwise because people from this Muslim world, the people from the Muslim world are doing everything they can to get to the They're doing everything they can to get here. They want to be here. Why? Because why? Why, Anjum? It seems, I mean, if it's as bad as Anjum is making it out to be, uh, people wouldn't want to come here. But in fact, uh, the entire world, if we open the floodgates, um, would, would come here uh, to the West because even though there are problems, as I admitted from the beginning, we deal with them within our system. And if you take a woman and say, hey, uh, here you are in the West, someone might sell you makeup, as Anjum complained about. Someone's going to sell you some makeup there, or uh, some, something else might happen. Uh, is that as bad as living under Sharia law, where she will be beaten, where men can have sex with her uh, when she's six or seven or eight years old? Uh, is it anywhere near as bad as what she would face under Sharia law? No. So any problem, any problem at all, Anjum can complain about here in the West is nothing, absolutely nothing compared to what people deal with under Islamic law. Thank so, you, Anjum, David. Thank you very much. And uh, we're about to go to our, our first break. Thank you, gentlemen. We've gotten through the first uh, third of our debate tonight. So we're going to go to break here, but I will make uh, one little announcement. Uh, we will, uh, this coming Tuesday, February 22nd, 8 o'clock to 9.30 Eastern Standard Time, Sheikh Omar Bakri Mohammed joins us on Jihad Exposed. The topic is about Egypt in a post-Mubarak era. We'll also discuss the Muslim Brotherhood as well. And then a week from tonight on Friday, uh, February 25th at 10 p.m., Dr. Wafa Sultan will join us live here in the studio uh, with political analyst Mahdi Kilhil and Tafik Hamid. So stay for, tuned for those programs and stay tuned as well. As we come back from our break here on Debate Night We'll be right back after this brief break. Thank you. Are you a Christian who loves watching ABN shows? Are you eager to make a video and post it online and see it reach millions of Middle Eastern people? Or are you a Muslim who wants an outlet to ask questions, make comments, or post video responses to Christian evangelists and apologists? Well, ABN Tube has it all. ABN Tube is an extended media outlet of ABN TV ministry. We've gotten an overwhelming response from viewers of ABN to launch a media outlet for people like you to upload your own video responses to some of the clips we have online, whether on ABNSAT.com or on our ABNSAT YouTube account. Our goal is to bring to light any and all lies about false religion through media to create an open dialogue about religion among people of different faith and to gear them to the truth of Jesus Christ. Please visit our site at www.abn2.com. Thank you. You are watching ABN. Welcome back to Debate Night, and we're going to pick right up where we left off. And at this point right now, we've got the clock set for five minutes. And Anjem, you can go ahead and start with your second rebuttal. Go right ahead. Thank you. Yes, I think that um, uh, David Woods is, is waking up. He's only got one sheet of paper, and Allah knows how much of that he's fabricated. I gave you so many statistics on the corruption and the degradation of America. Nobody can deny it. And he talks about the way the women are treated. Let me give you a few more. The National Violence Against Women survey said that 25% of women and 80% of men said they were raped or physically assaulted by the current or former spouse, cohabiting partner, or date in their lifetimes. You know what that is? That's about, if there's 200 million, uh, you know, uh, people in America, there's probably more, that is about 8 million men. 
That is about 80, you know, uh, Mexico stadiums of men being raped by women. Tell me about men being raped by, raped by women in uh, Muslim countries. You will never find it. Not only that, they say, he talks about education. Did you know that Fisher 2000, the National College of Women's Sexual, Sexual Victimization Study said one in five or one in four in college, women suffer complete or attempted rape during their college life. Every two minutes, the rain, calculation based on National Crime Victimization Service. Every two minutes, somewhere in America, someone is sexually assaulted. One out of every six women in America are victims of an attempted or complete rape. 1998, National Institute for Justice. And you know, when he talks about lists, let me give you a list. The number of children abused, uh, the number of uh, images downloaded on the internet. 51% America, 14% Russia, 11% Japan, Spain, 8%, uh, Thailand, 3%. Where, where's the uh, Muslim countries? I don't think you find them there. And the only reason that, that we have all of this corruption, by the way, is because you have your own dictators in our countries. You implement your own non-Islamic law, you prop up your own brutal regimes, you bomb us into smithereens, you introduce all of your pornography and all of your cosmetics and fashion industry, you pump them, people full of pornography, free of charge, by the way, in Muslim countries. You have to pay for it in America. And then, yeah, then after that, you wonder why there's these crimes emerging. That, that is because of your own way of life. If we got rid of freedom and democracy, we would not have those problems, and we never had them in our own history. And I can go on about that. Prostitution in America, you and the US CIA, 2000 study, 50,000 women and children, not five, not 50, 50,000 trafficked in America for sexual exploitation and forced labor. Someone in America, they say a woman is battered, battered, usually by her intimate partner every 15 seconds. That's a UN study on status of women year 2000. How many were there in uh, Muslim countries? You tell me. You talk about domestic violence. How come these statistics are conveniently absent? You know very well the more abuse takes place in America than any other country in the world. Because you don't have a system, you have anarchy in America, and there's no comparison. And let me, let me dispel some of the other myths. Under the Sharia, the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, whoever oppresses a non-Muslim or does not fulfill his right, he asks for him more than he can give, I will be against him a plaintiff on the day of judgment. Omar uh, bin uh, uh, Abdullah bin Omar, one of the great, uh, one of the great companions of the Prophet, he said the Prophet said, "Honor me with the people of covenant, the non-Muslims." The jizya, by the way, is much less than the Muslims pay zakat, and it will be not paid if we cannot protect their life and their honor. Hence, for example, in the time of Omar bin Abdul Aziz and many of the great uh, leaders, they paid back the jizya if we cannot defend them. But the Mus the, Mus the Christians used to fight alongside the Muslims against their own Christians from other countries because they saw the beauty and the justice that Islam gave them. You know, and we can go on and on about that. I mean, there's a lot of fabrication, sadly, about Islam. And, you know, I'd like to say a few of the, of the things that we will, in fact, do. You know, in America at the current time, you have an economic crisis. And, you know, uh, America is going to lose the dollar as the reserve currency. And then there's going to be deflation, and you will not be able to afford a loaf of bread, let alone anything more than that. You know, in Islam, they used use the gold and uh, silver standard. And there are many states in America going back to that. In Islam, there will be free food, clothing, and shelter, free electricity, gas, and water for all citizens. That is a situation I think every citizen in America, forget the rhetoric, would want. And they would easily ditch tomorrow what they have already with the American regime and indeed any country in Europe. Socially, the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa used to invite the men and the women of Medina to consult them. The suffragettes had to throw themselves under the king's horse. Then you got the vote in about 1918. Even now in America, it's a big thing if you're a woman and you have any kind of position, whereas there used to be judges and people consulted. The Prophet consulted his own wife, uh, Umm Salima, in the, in the highest degree in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah before he consulted any of his companions. And we can go on and on politically. There is no salary, so you have no kind of exploitation that the people have nowadays in the Senate and in the Commons, for example, in Britain. Rather, there was this well known that Umar bin al-Khattab, the Khalifa, he used to say, are you stealing the wealth of the Ummah, the wealth of the masses? Give it back to the Treasury and let us organize the affairs of the people. Even in the judiciary, we can see the maximum prison sentence in Islam is one month. For some of the scholars, up to one year. You have people in prison in America for 60, 70,000 years. That is a system that does not work. You have so many people in prison, you have, to bring, you have to make them in the desert. You have to release them. At the beginning of the 1990s, there were 1 million people in prison. At the end of the 1990s, 2 million. At that rate, by about okay. 40 years, all of America will be in prison. We, uh, we, didn't, we missed the, uh, the one-minute warning. I apologize for that, uh, Anjum. But we will uh, reset the clock right now to uh, David for David. And we've got five minutes for David Wood. Go right ahead. Well, again, Anjum is complaining a lot about the West. Um, I did give him statistics that the happiest countries in the world uh, to, to, to a country is our, our Western nations, and that there is a pattern, there's a correlation. Uh, the closer you get to the heart of the Muslim world, the less happy people are. Why? 
uh, as much as he complains about the West, it must be far, far worse in the Muslim world. That's why people want to leave the Muslim world and come uh, to the West. And anyone, anyone who lives in the West, you know this is nonsense. I walk down the street, my wife walks down the street, we do things, we go to school, we teach, we do all kinds of things, all my friends do. No one gets, we don't get raped. Do these things happen in the country? Uh, yes. But if you walk down the street, what do you find? You find peace. You find prosperity. Are there problems? Yes, again, but that happens everywhere in every society. Um, so th this, this, this anarchy, this anarchy that Anjum speaks about, I just, I, I've never seen it. And I live in the Bronx. I live in one of the, I mean, I live in one of the roughest cities uh, in America, and I have no clue what our friend Anjum is talking about. Uh, and so there is, this, there is this tendency to exaggerate all the problems of everyone else and to minimize the problems uh, in Islam. But remember, the question before us is not, are there difficulties in the West? I granted that from the beginning. The question is, is Sharia the answer? Would Sharia help? Um, and just think, because I think Anjum is really totally contradicting himself. Uh, he, he complains over and over again about the number of rapes. Uh, open up the Quran and open up Sahih, Buk Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim and Sunan Abu Dawood and see how many rapes you find at the hands of Muslims. What happens when Muslims would conquer an area? Revelation would come down. You can have sex with these women. Uh, what about Surah 424? Anjum, what's the, uh, what's the historical background for that? The historical background was that Muslims didn't want to have sex with these women because their husbands were there. Their husbands had been captured too. You've got husband and wife sitting there and Muslims say, oh no, we can't have sex with these women. And then the revelation comes down, of course you can. Rape them all you want. They're your captives. So think about what's going on here. Anjum complains, rape is something that's really, really bad. Violence is something that's really, really bad. Hey, I agree. The problem is those things are at the heart of Sharia law. You can rape your women all you want uh, in, under Sharia. You can go on a killing spree in Sharia. You can do those things. So Anjum has complained about things, and yet we find Sharia teaches exactly these things. So Anjum has contradicted himself. He's complaining about things that are fundamental to Sharia law. And so, in other words, if, uh, if rape and violence are bad, which I believe they are, then Sharia is not going to help because Sharia makes these things part of the will of God. So we have to reject Muhammad as a prophet since he's the one who delivered these revelations saying all these things that Anjum is complaining about are perfectly uh, acceptable. We have to reject Muhammad and therefore the law system that goes back to him. Um, so what reason do we have to think uh, that Islam will help anything. Again, is this going to help Christians? No, we'd be second-class citizens. Jews would be second-class citizens if they're not all slaughtered. Women, the rights that they have, and Anjum's still complaining, he's complaining about things like makeup and stuff. Um, what about Islamic law, where a husband can beat his wife into submission, where he can have four wives, uh, where you can rape your female captives, where girls who are six and seven and eight and nine years old are not protected because the Quran in Surah 65.4 says you can, have sex with, you can have sex with these girls all you want. Um, why, why does he think that our society would become better by adding all these new problems that we don't have to deal with? We don't have to deal with polygamy. We don't have to deal with uh, people marrying six- and seven-year-old girls. We don't have to deal with these. But if we adopt Sharia, we would have to. Uh, so we have a system here. And again, I agree with a ton of the things Anjum is saying about the West. I think we need to deal with them. But we can deal with them within our system. Uh, a, little, a century and a half ago, there was slavery. There's no slavery anymore. Why? We dealt with it. Uh, women couldn't vote a little over a century ago, uh, and they can vote now. Racial segregation, all these problems that you look at at the end of the 1700s and then the 1800s, we dealt with them. Again, new problems arise, but we deal with them within our system. You don't, and you don't deal with them by bringing in this new system that hasn't worked anywhere. And again, at, when Andrew says, oh, no, it works, what's he do? He says, oh, but a thousand years ago. It worked somewhere. Well, Anjum, you have 47 countries. You have a quarter of the world's population. Uh, where are the great scientific developments? Where's the great community developments in the Muslim world? Show me a place. Show me one of your 47 countries where someone who lives in the West would, would sit back and say, wow, I really want to move there. Or some non-Muslim would say, I really want to go there because Sharia law is so wonderful. Show us these places. Shouldn't, you, shouldn't Muslims be winning a quarter of the Nobel Prizes, be coming up with a quarter of the scientific developments? Shouldn't Muslims be doing these things? Why don't we see it? Why is it that Islam suffocates cultures, suffocates these places? Why is it that Islam suffocates okay, scientific you, David. And philosophical development? Thank you, David. Okay, uh, again, apologize for the abruptness, but we're going to move on to uh, the next section, which is our crossfire section. Each of you will have two minutes to make a, a statement, and at this point, we're resetting the clock, and Anjum, you have two minutes now. Go ahead and start 
our crossfire. Yes, um, uh, you know, it's very interesting that uh, David, uh, on the one hand, you know, it seems to me his knowledge about Islam is based upon maybe one or two trips to the library. And uh, that's not very good, is it, David? Because uh, you fabricated a lot of things about Islam and Muslims. And quite honestly, I'm not going to deal with your lies. Nowhere does it say in the Quran that you can rape people and, uh, you know, just use them for your own desire. This is rubbish. But what is, in fact, in fact, what is reality is that the International uh, uh, Statistics National Institute of Justice it said that one or five percent of the U.S. population molest their own children. And in fact, in the USA, uh, every 15 seconds, a woman is battered. Okay, so you're dealing with the problem. So what is it going to be in a few years' time? Is it going to be every 20 seconds or something like that? Is that the way we deal with our problem? I think that, you know, you're, you have become so used to the darkness and the hegemony of your own law, you cannot see outside of your own close circle. People are being raped and abused. You know, they say that, uh, you know, every uh, second, you know, there's uh, uh, sexual abuse and uh, I don't even know the statistics because there's so many of them. But let me tell you something about, let me tell you something about Islam. In Islam... Uh, the femininity and the masculinity of both the male and the female is protected. The Prophet said, do not employ the woman except for what she can do with her hands, even the handsome man, except for his effort. So you would never employ someone because of their gender or sexuality in Islam. It's completely prohibited, let alone a secretary or something like that, which happens all the time in the West. Moreover, countries like Sudan and Ethiopia used to be known as the fruit bowls of Africa when the Sharia was implemented. They used to export food. Nowadays, they're holding their begging bowls outside. Why? Not because of the Muslims there, but because you have your puppet leaders in the area. Let's not forget that the Iraqi dictator was uh, propped up by the American regime. The only weapons of mass destruction you found in Iraq were the ones you dropped upon the uh, Iraqi population. And the only weapons of mass destruction you found in Afghanistan, the ones you slaughtered the people with, under the guise of propaganda, freedom, and democracy. Over a million children died because of the sanctions of the oppressive uh, regimes. You know, it's no surprise that you're going to quote people like the United Nations and your own institutions, because they're corrupt just the way that you are. Thank well, you, Anja. We need to go back. You know. Thank you, Anja. Okay, David, you now have two minutes uh, for your time in our crossfire section. Please go right ahead. Anja began by saying that uh, I, I, I don't know what I'm talking about with Islam. He only gave one example um, of what I said that was false. He said that the Quran doesn't allow uh, rape of women. Well, let's examine the facts here. Surah 424 says that certain women are, married women are prohibited unless you capture them, except, the right, except those whom your right hands possess. So you can't have sex with a married woman unless you've captured her. We know from the Muslim sources, unless, <laughs> unless Anjum wants to throw out the Hadith, which I know he doesn't want to do, uh, we know from the Hadith what the historical situation for that revelation. I already said it. Again, Muslims conquer an area, but they conquered the men and the women. So they capture all of these women who are married. And the Muslims go to Muhammad saying, we don't want to have sex with these women because they're married. Great, guys. Great. Don't have sex with them. You're right. Don't have sex with these married women. But that's when Surah 424 came down saying, you can have all the sex you want with these women. Now, what does Anjum, what does Anjum think of that? That these women, these women who had just been captured, uh, whose family members have been slaughtered, uh, suddenly really want the Muslims? Oh, we really want to have sex with these guys. No. That revelation gave them permission to rape these women. Uh, that's what it is. And uh, if Anjum wants to say it's not true, he, he's got his own sources to deal with. Uh, and then Anjum once again contradicted his own teachings. He complained about women being battered in the United States. Anjum knows what Surah 434 says, and it gives husbands the right to beat their wives into submission. He knows that Muhammad beat Aisha. He knows that a woman was brought, a woman was brought to Muhammad and that her skin was greener than her clothes, according to Aisha. She sought justice. Will you stop my husband? Hus uh, Muhammad sent her away saying, you talked about your husband. You talked. You said bad things about your husband. Get out of here. He didn't help her. So what do we have? Anjum is complaining about all these things, rape and violence and abuse of women, and they're exactly the things that are condoned and supported under Sharia law. They're not supported by our system. We throw people in jail. Thank husband, you. Wife, we Thank you, in. David. Okay, and now we will let uh, Anjum respond in two minutes. Yes, I mean, uh, you know, David, uh, I think you should realize one thing. That the Sharia is, in fact, not implemented anywhere in the world nowadays. The last time it was implemented as the law and order was before the 3rd of March 1924. Therefore, the countries which you see today, in fact, are dictatorships and they're barbaric, just as much as the American regime is, in fact, barbaric. And when you talk about, um, you know, uh, women being able to be beaten in Islam, that's not what Allah said in the Quran in chapter 434. It said to advise them and it said to, uh, you know, separate the beds, etc., in order to avoid any kind of physical confrontation. And I note, that he did not deal with the statistic of uh, every 15 seconds a woman's b being battered in America. And moreover, you know, when you look at your own history, I mean, you know, he talks about how uh, the assault against slavery, etc. 
The 200th conference the, on the anniversary of the formal end of the slave trade in Jamaica said that many churches were actively involved, in fact, in the transatlantic trade in Africans and colonialism. The church is guilty of promoting racism and colonialism that destroyed the African societies. So if we have uh, mayhem nowadays, it's because of your own, if you like, uh, um, uh, antics in Muslim countries. And we can see, you know, as far back as uh, just the 1960s, you know, people were racist. Even now, if you go to America in the, far, in, the, in, the, in the South, in the Midwest, you know, you have all of this racism, the Ku Klux Klan, etc. Who are you trying to kid? I mean, you know, as I said, if you're black in America and you get a job, that's a feat nowadays. And, you know, he talks about, uh, you know, institutions. And I was just saying earlier, you know, how is it that uh, he talks about peace prizes and prizes for development when Barack Obama got the Nobel Peace Prize? And we know that he increased the troops in Afghanistan and Iraq, and he's got more blood on his hands than even Bush had before because of the number of people he's, he's sending to their death. And incidentally, it is the American soldiers who are committing suicide and the British in Iraq and Afghanistan. There's not even one incident of any Muslim having committed suicide. Why? Because your war is unjust, your government is corrupt, and you have an oppressive foreign policy. None of the Muslims are committing suicide. Name me one example, and we'll go there, we'll find out. And yeah, the Americans are committing Very suicide. Very much. Okay. David, you uh, will now have two minutes to respond to that. Muslims committing suicide, it happens almost every day when a Muslim blows himself up trying to kill the, uh, the Kufar. Um, he says uh, Sharia is not being implemented anywhere in the world. Notice um, when I spoke, I quoted, a, I quoted a bunch of things from Islam, so um, I'm not sure what, what countries today have to do with, with what I said in that, in that previous statement. Um, but uh, think about what he's saying. Sharia doesn't work. Muslims have four, 47 countries and uh, a quarter of the world's population, and they can't get Sharia to work anywhere. Well, if it can't work in the Muslim world, and even Muslims aren't willing to implement it because they don't like it, why would we think that we should adopt it here in the West? It just doesn't make any sense. Now, he again complained about women being battered, and uh, he says that's not what the Quran says. Well, in Surah 434, uh, it, it talks about um, if you fear rebellion on the part of your wives, you admonish them, leave them alone in sleeping places, and beat them. Uh, we know the historical situation. A woman came to Muhammad for justice. The handprint was still on her face where her husband had slapped her in the face. She came to Muhammad for justice. Muhammad was about to rule in her favor. And then Surah 434 came down saying, uh, too bad. I want, and what did Muhammad say? He said, I wanted one thing, Muhammad. I mean, I wanted one thing and Allah wanted something else. In other words, I wanted to rule in your favor, but Allah didn't want to. Uh, in Sahih Muslim number 2127, uh, Muhammad hits Aisha in her chest. Um, you have over and over again, Umar beating women, uh, Abu Bakr beating women. Uh, you have this over and over again in the Muslim sources, and if Anjum wants me to quote some of them, uh, no problem. But think about this. Anjum complains. There are, there's abuse in the West. I agree. It's horrible. But we need to do something about that. That would include punishing the offenders. If we bring in Sharia, that just makes it okay. What did Muhammad say? No one shall be asked as to why he beat his wife. So all the abuse you're complaining about, Anjum, Sharia doesn't fix that. It just makes it the will of God, and you can't even ask him. Right now, we catch a man beating his wife, we throw him in jail. Under Sharia, you can't even ask him why he beat his wife. That's your law. So your law cannot deal with the problems. Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Okay. And now, at this point, we will give each of you a five-minute uh, time period to make a final closing statement. And go right ahead, if you would, on Jim. Yes. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. What we've seen today is that there's no doubt that uh, Western civilization and society is completely corrupt, and even Eastern civilization and society. And the reason for that is because of man-made law, much of that exported by countries like America and Britain. So we can see, for example, as we said, some of the biggest industries in the world today, like pornography, cosmetics, gambling, drugs, alcohol, etc., will be completely eradicated under Islam. And we can see that uh, as well, you know, in most of the countries in the West, the everyday living expenses do not meet Sorry, the income does not meet the everyday living expenses because people are being exploited. Uh, the, the funds are being, if you like, uh, siphoned off by fat cats and uh, the rest of the population are left there to try to make ends meet. Under the Sharia, we can see in every aspect of life, Islam is superior. So we see, for example, in the economic system, there will be free food, clothing, or shelter. There will be free, if you like, water, gas, electricity. In Islam, there will be the gold standard, so that would eradicate inflation. Moreover, the, you know, Islam is the only, uh, if you like, system in, in history which eradicated poverty. In the time of Umar bin Abdul Aziz, uh, Rahimullah, he said, make prostration because Allah has eradicated poverty in our time. He rather tests us with opulence. We find, for example, in the time of Ma'moon, they left great cauldrons of golden dinar in the public arena for the people to take whatever they wanted, but they didn't take anything because 
you know, that all of their needs were already met. Make a comparison between that, by the way, and what happened in New Orleans when you had a little bit of a flood, or what happened in New York when you had a bit of a power cut. People were killing and raping and pillaging each other. You know, they didn't need an excuse for that. In a social system, we can see that Islam treats a woman as a mother, as a, as a daughter, as a sister, as an aunt. Whereas in the West, you can see that the femininity, femininity and the masculinity is uh, exploited. There are so many rapes, not only of the women, but also of the men. And we can see that Islam gave the women the right to participate in the political process as, as long ago as the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when he consulted the men and the women of Medina. And as well, uh, the women were judges. In fact, they were great people. And uh, they were treated uh, for their dignity and their honor, as opposed to a sex object, as we see in the West nowadays. And we can see in the judiciary as well that um, in uh, 1,300 years, there were only, in fact, ever, you know, 60 hands, uh, uh, sorry, uh, less than 200 hands of a cut, 60 reported rapes. Whereas in the West, you can see this has become a pandemic, an epidemic, and there's no way for you to come out of this quagmire. So I think that uh, David would agree that uh, we need to have divine law. Because I don't think he agrees with pornography and gambling and, uh, and uh, the drugs and alcohol and all of the other promiscuity within society. Because if he does, then I'm afraid, you know, that's not what Jesus said. In fact, Jesus would agree with me uh, completely because he never accepted any of those vices. So for him to say that Islam is no good because, you know, these things should be allowed to remain, this is complete nonsense. Even under his own, uh, if you like, teachings, all of these things are completely prohibited. And uh, therefore, he should really be agreeing with me. And when I talk about uh, the rights... There's no comparison between the rights in Islam and the rights under your law. For example, the fetus in Islam has a right of inheritance. Women were treated as chattels, you know, as long ago as 100 years ago. Only in about, uh, you know, um, uh, the 19th, uh, the 20th century did women, in fact, have a right of inheritance. We got this over 1,400 years ago. And we can see, in fact, in every single, uh, if you like, aspect, Islam is superior. So we can even see, for example, uh, in the foreign policy, and in the judiciary and uh, the social system and so on. So basically what I would like to say to the people in America and around the world is that if you look at the inimitability of the Quran, you look at the, uh, the miracle of the Quran linguistically, scientifically, historically, you will have no choice but to accept the rational mind will have to accept the messengership of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam as a mercy for mankind. And if you accept that, you will say the shahada, which is the way you become Muslim to say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasulu. I bear testimony that there's no one truly worthy of worship and obedience and following except for Allah. And I bear testimony that the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is his final prophet and servant. And then you will become part of the biggest, if you like, growing uh, uh, you know, uh, community in the world. And by the way, Islam is the fastest growing religion in all of Western societies, including in America and Britain. More people are becoming Muslim in Britain than any other religion, and especially among young Western women. So if we're abusing them so much, how comes the young Western women? You know, a good example recently is Tony Blair's own sister-in-law, Lauren Booth. She said Islam gives her dignity and honor. Why didn't she uh, stay a Christian? Why, is this, why did she embrace Islam? Is she, you know, uh, does she not know? She knows very well what's going on with your own societies, within your own system, and she decided to give up the decadence and the hegemony of man-made law and the oppression of secularism and the problem of give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what is God's and accept that God has a say in every aspect of society. Sovereignty and supremacy belong to God, not to man. Therefore, Islam is the way forward for mankind. And inshallah, you know, we will see it in America. I look forward to the day for the flag of Islam to rise high over the White House and Rome and Ten Downing Street Thank and the whole of you. Europe. Is coming. Thank you very much for that final five-minute uh, closing statement. And David, at this point, will get the clock ready and we will give you an opportunity to make your final closing statement. Go right ahead. All right. Well, uh, uh, towards the end there, he, he asked the question, why are women converting to Islam? And it's a simple reason, actually. They don't tell them the truth about Islam. Muslims don't tell women the truth about Islam. They say, oh, in the West, the West it, 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 it corrupts you. The West treats you bad. The West objectifies you. In Islam, it's not like that. And Anjum even said that uh, women aren't sex objects in Islam. I'm wondering if he's read the Quran, Surah 2, verse 223, which says, your women are a tilth unto you. So approach your tilth when and how you will. It's talking about their bodies, using their bodies to approach however you want. And read their greatest commentaries. Read Tafsir Jalalain and see what it says about that verse. You approach them from the front, the back, however you want, however you want to do it with these women. That's what you do. Anjum, tell me. Uh, if a woman is cooking or, or working hard and she's tired, she's been working all day and she has a headache and her husband calls her to have sex and she doesn't want to come, what happens? The angels curse her until morning because she didn't do exactly what her husband says. Uh, don't tell me that Islam doesn't objectify women. We saw the statistics on women in Islam, women in the Muslim world. Now, Anjum is right about one thing. 
Uh, many people in the West are concerned with all kinds of things, things like drugs, alcohol, promiscuity, uh, violence against women. Uh, but the great thing about the West is that if you don't like something, you're free to do something about it. You're free to start organizations. You're, you're free to start action networks. You're free to campaign and to petition the government. You're free to argue with people and to convince them that you're right. That's how we handle things. In other words, whatever problems we face, we can deal with these problems within our system. Our system allows us, Anjum, to bring about change. The Islamic world stagnates. It doesn't improve. Uh, so Anjum tells us, and it's very strange, that, that we should reject our system, which shows progress, and we should reject freedom and democracy, the, the very ideals that have brought uh, such prosperity to the West. Uh, and in place of freedom and democracy, he, we should adopt Sharia. But what does Anjum really mean? Uh, he means that we're supposed to accept Muhammad as the ultimate authority in ethics and psychology and sociology and politics. Uh, but, but who's Muhammad that, that we should submit to his authority in all things? He's a man who had sex with a nine-year-old girl. He married more women than his own revelations allowed. He married the wife of his own adopted son. He had sex with his slave girls. According to Muslim sources, not according to me, according to Muslim sources, uh, Muhammad's first impression of his revelations was that they were demonic in origin. According to Muslim sources, Muhammad became suicidal and tried to hurl himself off a cliff. According to Muslim sources, Muhammad delivered revelations to his followers, promoting polytheism. Then he came back later and said, sorry, the devil tricked me into doing it, showing that he couldn't tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from the devil. According to Muslim sources, Muhammad was the victim of black magic. That's Sahih al-Bukhari. Muhammad supported idolatrous pagan practices like kissing the black stone and bowing down to the Kaaba, practices which are part of Islam today. Muhammad assassinated people for criticizing his religion. He executed people for making fun of him. He beheaded hundreds of Jews for trying to defend themselves once they realized he was trying to eliminate them. Muhammad started a war with Mecca when he had a chance to live in peace. In Medina, he enslaved thousands of people. He allowed his followers to rape their female captives. And yes, he took the most beautiful captives back to his own tent. Muhammad told his followers that it's okay to beat their wives into submission. And we know from Sahih Muslim that he beat Aisha. Muhammad told his followers that women are stupid and that their testimony is worth half that of a man. Muhammad tortured people for money. He supported his religion by robbing people. He preached a message of violence and oppression and cruelty. And he taught his followers to believe in a God who loves only them and no one else. Anjum complains uh, about all kinds of things. Uh, he complains about uh, what Muslim, I mean, what, what, what uh, American soldiers or British soldiers are doing in Muslim lands. He complains about rape and violence. Uh, he says that Sharia would end this. It would end abuse. It would end uh, abuse against women. Uh, but how is Sharia going to end killing when Muhammad called for killing? How is Sharia going to end raping when Muhammad allowed his followers to rape their captives? How, how, is, and how is Sharia going to stop abuse of women when Islam tells its followers, you have a divine right to beat your women into submission. What Anjum really means is that Sharia will keep, do it, uh, keep people uh, out of his business and out of the Muslim world. Um, he doesn't mean it will end these practices. He just means it will, uh, it will uh, uh, complaining about this might help someone convert to Islam and might uh, keep people from doing something in Muslim lands. And so this debate shows us the essence of Sharia. The heart of Muslim ethics is hypocrisy and inconsistency and double standards. You can do just about anything you want to non-Muslims. You can kill them, you can rape them, but you better not do anything to Muslims uh, or Anjum Chowdhury is coming after you. Okay, David, with a few seconds to spare, thank you very much, gentlemen. We have, we've gotten through our debate portion. At this point, we're going to be going to our break here, but you know, uh, I'm not hearing any phone calls. I'm not hearing the phone ringing. This could be a great opportunity for you to pick up the phone right now and call that number, 248-416-1300. We will be taking calls after we get back from the break, which is coming up here. You can also email us your questions anytime at debate at abnsat.com. Uh, continue to know, too, that we do have a ministry here, and we do rely on your support. We appreciate the fact that you're watching. Hopefully, you'll be calling in. We certainly appreciate any financial support and certainly always your prayers. So continue to consider that. We're going to go to break here, but just to let you know, we have open lines right now. So again, 248-416-1300. -416 and sh the question would be, the topic for tonight, would Sharia help the West? So you've heard the discussions, you've heard the debates. Now it's your turn to be heard. So give us a call, 248-416-1300. We're getting ready for those questions and those comments. 
Please give us a call, and we'll be right back after this break. If you are a user on Facebook, ABN will be happy to add you as a friend. Simply search ABN Sat and add us as a friend. After doing so, send and we will approve your request. ABN loves to add new members, so find us and we hope to see you soon. Muslims saying Islam's about peace. Islam's about peace. We have no violence in us. No, Islam's about peace. The man does some cartoons. Old man in Denmark. The whole world, Muslims go crazy. Burn down embassies. Blow up places. Tear down American uh, uh, hamburger joints in Pakistan. questions, please visit our website at www.abnsat.com. Under the webcast tab, you can view ABN's live streaming channels like Jesus or Muhammad, Youth TV, Apologetics, and more. We also encourage you to donate to our ministry. To do so, click on Donate to ABN under the main menu, then click on Donate button to make your donation. ABN greatly appreciates your help. Okay, you have responded, you've made the calls, and we are ready now to take our first caller of tonight. And at this point, we are ready, and just to let everybody know, we're going to make, make you stick with one question. We want to move on, we want to make sure that we have as many people as we can to get through our question portion. So go right ahead, tell us your question, sir, and who is yes. it directed to? Yes, hello? Hello. Yes, hello. Um, well, uh, thank God for this uh, debate that uh, is run in the West. Yes. Not in Pakistan or Saudi Arabia. Otherwise, David Wood's head will be chopped off. <laughs> That's a proof for uh, the Sharia that Mr. Anjim is talking about. Um, my question to Mr. Anjim, if Sharia law is compatible with life, why the uh, Muslim countries doesn't, doesn't take these Sharia law and implement it there? And I give you an example for Saudi Arabia. It's run by the King Abdullah, and there is no kingdom in Islam. It's only Khalifa that who should run the Muslim Ummah. So this is a proof that uh, Sharia is not even compatible with Muslim countries. Second, Mr. Anjim said that... Just uh, one question. Put the statistics about just, one, just one question. Let Anjim answer that question, please, sir. Thank you very much. Anjim, go right ahead. Yes, um, uh, this has a very simple answer, in fact. Um, you know, the Sharia was implemented for over 1,300 years, from 622 until 1924. And it wasn't, in fact, the, uh, the Muslims who dismantled the Sharia. In fact, the British and the French, they occupied the Ottoman Empire, and they uh, forcibly removed the Khalifa, sent him to Malta, and, and uh, put in place a secular regime. So it's not because the Muslims don't want to implement it. If you make a comparison, the capitalist uh, liberal democracy that you have nowadays has only been around for the last 120, or 150 or 200 years. And yet at the same time, it's on the verge of collapse. 
we can see that all of the diseases of Western civilization that we talked about earlier, pedophilia, rape, uh, debauchery, you know, pornography, alcohol, drugs are running completely rampant. We're talking about anarchy system. This system is going to collapse upon itself. It needs uh, Islam to uh, lance this uh, pus-filled boil, which you call capitalism, and the way that it looks nowadays. And uh, it's only a matter of about 87 years, but Islam is coming back. We can see the Muslims rising in Muslim countries. And then when you establish the Sharia, don't worry, you know, we will establish the Sharia as well and liberate you from the shackles of man-made law, even in America. David, would you like to respond to that, please? Uh, j just, just briefly, notice, uh, according to Anjim, uh, Sharia was working great until the British and the French came along and stopped it and put an end to it. And now you've got a quarter of the world's population are Muslims. You've got 47 uh, Muslim-majority countries, and they just can't get it back. Well, I mean, think about uh, Islamic theology. Um, isn't Allah supposed to be protecting this? Isn't Islam supposed to advance and never retreat and take over the world? And what we just heard from Anjum is that the British and the French are just more powerful than Islam and Sharia and, and Allah, and, and they can stop it. Um, strange teachings, considering what I read in the Quran. Okay. We've got another caller, and we're ready to take that next question. One yes. question again. We'll remind you. One question, and tell us your question, and who is it directed to? Hi. Manu? This, yes, hi. This question is toward uh, David Wood. I have okay. a um, uh, question from David. Uh, uh, it seems that the... Uh, Western society is not compliant with the gospel itself, according to the uh, Surah 5, um, uh, verse 47. He says, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah or God has revealed therein. So in what way would you consider that if Christianity wanted to implement the gospel, would also take away the rights and freedoms of uh, a lot of people a lot of segments of society in terms of the uh, when it affects employment of women or whether it would be marriage or or uh, other freedoms in in what way would you uh, do you believe that the Christianity is not also judging by what God has revealed in the gospel to protect everybody's rights we have just given a free-for-all pretty much to for anybody to regulate themselves and and you know go, go from that quoted the Quran to say how Christians are, what Christians are supposed to deal, uh, are supposed to do with the gospel, and it's, it's, it's not part of Christianity. In Christianity, we're not told uh, to subjugate unbelievers and to force them to agree with our system. Jesus said, um, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Um, and he's saying this in a time with, with the Roman emperors, and they were horribly unjust and horribly immoral. Um, he didn't say, you go and conquer the Roman emperor. Uh, the Apostle Paul uh, said, who am I to judge those outside the church? Let God judge those outside the church. So Christians are supposed to have a community, uh, a community of Christians. We live together, but we don't uh, dominate and subjugate. True, as Enjim, I'm sure Enjim is waiting to point out, uh, Christians have tried this. Christians have abused power. And I think that's part of the wisdom behind the gospel. Uh, if you go out and try to, 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 be, uh, to dominate the world or to do things that, that some Christians have done, uh, you're going to end up corrupting the church. And that's why you end up with lots of these bad things um, as part of the church. So in Christianity, we don't try to, uh, uh, to, um, to subjugate people or to dominate the world. We might try to influence people. We try to influence people um, to be more loving and to, to care for the rights of others, things like that. Um, but subjugating unbelievers just isn't a part of it. It is part of Islam. It is part uh, of Sharia, which is why I'd say the West is more compatible um, with, with uh, a Christian ideology uh, in the sense that Christians are free to do what they want and Christians aren't going to interfere with the government as opposed to Islam, which is ultimately going to try to take over the government and subjugate everyone. Okay, Anjum, you can respond if you'd like. Yes, um, it's very convenient for David to say the Christians are not going to interfere because he doesn't have a solution. Christian has no economic policy, no judicial policy, no foreign policy, no ruling system, no social system. When it was implemented, we can see what happened. Uh, you know, it was under Christianity, in fact, that, uh, you know, all of the acquisitions took place. You know, if I want to quote something, you know, the Christians were uh, against knowledge. We can see, for example, the church set up religious courts to counter the rise of the intelligentsia. In 1415, uh, John Huss w was burnt in Constantine, and even his student, Jerome, in 1416. We can see, for example, that uh, under the Spanish Inquisition, that um, in 1486 in Toledo, 750 men, women, and children were marched in the parade of shame, and they were convicted. Uh, they were convicted twice, 
and those committed twice were killed. Synagogues, the masajid, etc., were burned to the ground. We can see that uh, when Christianity was implemented, if you do not worship the Christian God, God, when if you use medical, uh, if you like methods not authorized by the state, then you would be killed. So we can see that when Christianity had any kind of power, which in fact, you know, I think deep down uh, David hopes that it, it does have some kind of a say within society. It was so oppressive towards the society that your own people rose up against it and eradicated it from the face of the earth. Not an outside power like the French and the British, but the Christians themselves. You know, for your information, just one last point, you know, mass killing of people, mass murder and genocide is not a new phenomenon. That is precisely what the Catholics were doing to the Protestants and burning, burning them at stake, you know, in the dark ages. And they're called dark because of the hegemony of Christianity. Okay, we're going to move on to the next question. The next caller, you may go right ahead, sir, and make your question known to us. And who is it directed to? It's directed to Anjum, but I'd like David to respond. And very quickly, uh, this is regarding the statistics that Anjum quoted. And it's very convenient that he can quote United Nations statistics, uh, which is supposedly, according to him and him, a corrupt uh, organization uh, influenced by U.S. It seems like U.S. is very self uh, evaluative and uh, honestly, honestly self evaluates itself. Whereas uh, when it comes to the Muslim nations, it seems to have very, uh, uh, when it, United Nations should have actually shown a bad light. Uh, being a corrupt organization, it did not show the statistics otherwise. And the, but uh, Anjum is very inconsistent because he comes back and he says these are ruled by dictators and uh, they they suppress the Sharia over there. Apparently, the statistics was very much in his favor. David, I think you should respond to that when <clears throat> once Anjum uh, responds to this. Thank you. Did you get that, David? No, he, he said once Anjum responds. Okay. Okay. Well, let me just say something that. Um, you know, uh, the reason why I quoted the United Nations, because you can't run away from the United Nations statistics. I don't believe that everything they say is correct. I believe that they're diluting many of them, because if the real statistics came out, I think it would be even more shocking than they are already. But even from your own statistics, you know, watered down, diluted, you can see that uh, the situation in the West, uh, you know, especially in America and Britain and other parts of Europe, is worse than any other place in the world. You know, I have comparisons. I've got a chart here of comparing every single country, you know, and uh, robberies and rape. And the worst are the Americans and the British and the French, you know, and the Belgium, etc. You know, you can have the copies if you want. I can email them to you. This is not something that I invented myself. The fact and the reality is that, uh, you know, under the hegemony of man-made law, we find this kind of situation. And, uh, you know, when you look at Muslim countries, yes, there are problems there. That's why we need to eradicate man-made law in Muslim countries and in non-Muslim countries. But that was never the situation when the Sharia was implemented. Under the Sharia, for your information, in Spain, and by the way, it was also implemented in parts of Austria, Switzerland, Reeds, uh, sorry, Creed, you know, Rhodes, Cyprus, many parts in, in, in Europe, you know, you never had this problem. In fact, many of the Christian and the Jewish texts were translated into modern-day European languages under the Sharia. The same cannot be said when Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand uh, instigated the Inquisition against the Jews and the Muslims. David, your response well, to that? Uh, notice the, the, the topic before us is would Sharia help the West? And um, throughout this debate uh, pointed out lots of problems with the West. Um, I dispute some of the statistics he brings up because they conflict with certain things, but uh, overall I'm not going to dispute uh, that there are all kinds of problems in the West and in every other country in the world and in every other country in history. The question was, is Islam the solution? Uh, and on this issue of statistics, for instance, he's claiming, ah, the pornography, all, these, all this pornography and, and everything else and on the Internet, is, it's, it's, it's in the West. Um, the question was um, about the United Nations and using their statistics. Let me just give you Google statistics. Let me give you Google statistics here. Um, Google ranks Pakistan number one in the world in searches for pornographic terms, outranking every other country in the world in searches per person for certain sex-related content. Here are the statistics. Pakistan is top in searches per person for horse sex since 2004, donkey sex since 2007, rape pictures between 2004 and 2009, rape sex since 2004, child sex between 2004 and 2007 and since 2009, animal sex since 2004, dog sex since 2005, uh, and the country also is tops or has been number one in searches for sex, camel sex, rape video, child sex video, and all kinds of other searches that can't even be printed uh, on Fox News. So Anjum is, uh, again, he's, he's quoting these statistics, and uh, Google tells a very different picture of what kind of things uh, Muslim countries are looking for. Okay, we've got another caller. 
Uh, we are ready with that next caller, and the question, yeah. sir, is directed to which debater? You may go right ahead. Hello, sir. Hello? Hello. Hello. Uh, my question to Mr. Anjum, I belong to Pakistan, and I am Christian, thanks God. Uh, my question is, when he talks about Sharia, which Sharia? The Sharia Hanfi, Maliki, or which Sharia he's talking about? Because all Muslims, they are not uh, agree on one Sharia. Okay? They all have different. In Pakistan, when they kill each other, they kill each other because of they have different kind of Sharia. Okay. I put this question to Mr. Anjum, please. Okay. Anjum. Yes. Um, yes, I mean, uh, I believe in the Sharia of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Quran, which is basically according to the understanding of the first generation, the Sahaba. So, you know, we don't differ on many things. And I know there are different schools of opinion and schools of thought which came later. But can I just say one thing? You know, David Woods, he was talking about uh, what people download in America. You know, in, 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 sorry, in Pakistan. You know, in America, in 28 states, bestiality is legal. I mean, they may be downloading some things in Pakistan, but Americans are actually doing it. So in America, you know, when someone says your mother-in-law is a cow, she could really be a cow because people having a relationship with animals over there, like nobody's business inside their homes. So I don't think there's any comparison, you know, and, uh, you know, and who exported it in the first place? You know, the biggest uh, child pornographers are in America. Over 50% are downloading child porn in America. So, you know, I don't think if your house is made of uh, glass, I don't think, uh, David, what, you should be throwing stones because, you know, your house is very, very feeble. Okay, David, uh, you can respond if you'd like. This call happens to be from England, actually. Um, well, think about what, what Anjum is saying. Um, yes, there's all this corruption in the Muslim world, uh, but that's because of what the West is doing. Think about this. Think about what he's saying. First, yeah, there was Sharia for centuries, and then the British and the French, they came in and just wiped Sharia out. And now you have all of these Muslim countries who have the Quran, who are reading the Quran, who are studying the Quran, who are, who are going to school to, to, to memorize the Quran. They're doing all of this, and you just can't compete with the internet. Well, if devout Muslims, people who believe in Muhammad, people who um, are convinced that he's a prophet, that Sharia is the way to go, if these people can't resist the horrible influence of the West, how are Westerners going to adopt Sharia, and how are Westerners going to use Sharia to, um, to, to do away with all of our problems? Anjum has said over and over again, Sharia will stop all these problems. It's not stopping it in Muslim countries. Why should we think that it will work over here? So what Anjum is telling us is that Sharia is powerless in the face of Western democracy. Sharia is powerless even in Muslim countries. Why should we think that somehow it's going to be great and powerful uh, here in the West? Okay, we have another caller. The name is William. Go ahead, William. Uh, give Thank us your you. uh, question, and who is it directed to? It's uh, directed to Mr. Anjum, and uh, I just want a quick comment. Uh, he said uh, the West does not have an economy, uh, a good e economic policies. I just wanted to know uh, uh, why for 1,400 years the Islamic world did not progress to the point where, like the United States in 300 years, they were open, uh, they were able, able to land on the moon. Anyway, my question is, how are you going to enforce your Sharia in the United States, uh, being that the majority are Christians and the minorities, a uh, very small minority of Islam? So what, what do you have in, in the box? What, what are you hiding over there? Uh, for the Christian, the majority of Christian. How are you going to treat them? And uh, please don't dance around the issue. Just answer the straight question. I thank you very much. You know, for your information, uh, um, Islam is the only way of life which ever eradicated poverty. As I said in the time of Umar bin Abdul, Umar bin Abdul Aziz, Rahimullah, you know, the, he, they said that they eradicated poverty. Even they used to live big cauldrons of uh, golden denar in the public arena. And Islam, food, clothing, and shelter is free of charge. And resources like, uh, you know, uh, electricity, gas, etc., would be provided for every citizen. You know, if you look at America now, you know, they have the largest GDP in the world, and yet they're on the brink of collapse. You know, they say that, uh, you know, uh, um, they project that what is going to happen to America after deflation and the dollar losing its uh, reserve currency status is going to be 10 times worse than what happened in the uh, recession. So, you know, capitalism has failed. Communism is dead. Islam is the only way forward for society and civilization. 
you know, and things like stocks, shares, insurance, pensions, all the invisible wealth will be completely eradicated. We deal with tangible wealth under Islam. You know, if you want to study uh, the Sharia and what Islam says about the economic system, you know, we have many, many uh, lectures uh, on this in every aspect. And as for your, you know, we send someone to the moon, you know, just because someone can go to the moon and, you know, stand on the mountain, you know, without any clothes on or go to the bottom of the ocean, that does not mean that you're civilized. You want to ask the question, what's he doing on the moon in the first place? You should be on the earth worshiping God. You know, don't waste your time and all, all of that money going somewhere where, you know, we know there's nothing there to be found in the first place. So I think this is very foolish of the Americans. And many people have had doubt that anyone stepped on the moon in the first place. We know about those, uh, uh, you know, uh, stories as well. But I don't think that's a sign of revival. Rather, that's a sign of decline, I think, of the nation. Okay, we're going to move to the next caller. Go ahead with your call and your question, sir. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead with your question. Okay, my question is a simple one to Amjam and David. What would happen to me as a Kufar, as a Dehimi, under Sharia law, if I was to have a pig roast um, and invite all my friends over and just have a good time, have a celebration, uh, have a pig roast? Um, that's my question. Okay, Andrew, would you like to respond, please? Well, I mean, you know, in the public arena, definitely the sale of anything which is prohibited in Islam will be prohibited. Alcohol, you know, pork, uh, you know, whatever, uh, you know, drugs, uh, you know, uh, if you like, cocaine, etc. You know, all of these things which are an anathema to anyone with good taste and, uh, and uh, good sense would, of course, be completely prohibited because Islam is a mercy for mankind. But, you know, what you do in your own home, whether you're doing it with your donkey or, you know, eating the pork and whatever you're roasting, nobody's going to be spying on you in your own home. You know, and, uh, you know, Islam gives the rights uh, to non-Muslims of food coating and shelter. The churches and the synagogues, you know, in Muslim countries are still there for over a millennium. So what you do in your church and your synagogue and your home is your business. You know, we are, we are not into the mass kind of graves and the genocide that we see in Iowa, in Palestine, you know, in Kosovo, you know, through Hitler. They are Christian and uh, Jewish, if you like, massacres. This did not happen under the name of Islam. Rather, that is your own invention. So I don't think you can make a comparison between your way of life and our perfect and beautiful way of life. David, would you like to respond, please? Yeah, Anjum just referred to Christian massacres, and here's the difference. Uh, if a Christian massacres anyone, he has rejected the teachings of Jesus. He has ignored jesus teachings and that's the difference in christianity we are not allowed to hurt or kill anyone we're commanded to love everyone uh that's part of the reason western society has flourished if there's a person living down the street and i don't know him and he's not part of my family i have to love him anyway uh and so we care for one another i'm not saying everyone does i'm saying that's what we're commanded to do we are called to a very high standard do we live up to that standard we often fail but we're called to a very high standard uh, but when a christian does commits atrocities, he's going against what he's commanded to do. In Islam, if you go and kill Jews or Christians for, for whatever reason, um, <laughs> what's the problem? That's exactly what Muhammad did. Yeah, you can find some reason. Um, oh, they, 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 didn't, they didn't accept Islam and they didn't immediately submit to Muslim rule. And once they saw that other Jews were being kicked out, they tried to form an alliance. Therefore, we slaughtered them all and, and enslaved the rest. Um, you find violence upon violence. Uh, just in the lifetime of Muhammad, uh, does Anjum really believe that Islam spread within just a few decades from Mecca all the way to Spain um, peacefully? Does he not know that this was an aggressive, offensive confrontation? Uh, of course it was. Uh, so when he's talking about Sharia being the solution for all these things, we look at the West and we value people's rights because we care about them. Uh, we care about other people having, having rights, and he's just admitted. He's just admitted, no, you can't do certain things as a Christian. It doesn't matter whether you agree with it or not. Uh, you better hide in your church and not let us know what you're doing in there uh, because we're going to dominate. We're going to dominate, and that's, that's just what Sharia commands him to do. Okay, great. We have one more question for the night because we're just about out of time here. Angel, tell us your question, and who's it directed to, please? Uh, it's directed to Angel. Okay. Okay, my question is, why we need to pass the Sharia law coming from a man who was sent by the devil, and he was a killer, he was a raper, uh, he was a black magic, uh, he was a married and children. He thinks the woman is not completed, and she have a chicken of mine, and uh, the woman, most of women in hell are 
the hell is mostly women? Why we want to believe from Sharia law brought by a man? He wasn't even sent from God. He was sent from the devil because everything he acted on, from killing uh, to rape to everything, was the devil. Angel, let, a, let him answer. Let Angel answer. That. Yeah, you know, I think, um, I think what uh, this lady is doing, she's looking at uh, pictures of Obama and Bush and attributing it to the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What I would say is that sanity is a blessing. If you look at what the American uh, government are doing in Guantanamo Bay, in Bagram Air Base, torturing people who are completely innocent, uh, abusing them, that is the reality and the nature of secularism. Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what is God's. Rather, there's no uh, evidence of the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ever raping someone. Rather, he is a mercy for mankind. And he came in and he removed people from worshipping idols to worship the one true God. And he fixed all of the misconceptions and the lies which were uh, introduced into Christianity and Judaism. And uh, he brought the inimitable word of God, the Quran, which is a miracle for everyone. And once again, I ask your listeners and your viewers to embrace the truth of Al-Islam and to give up the falsehood of all other religions, including Christianity, Judaism, Sikhism, Hinduism, and all of systems like democracy and liberalism and so on. David, your last response of the night. Uh, yeah, I actually think uh, uh, the sister brought up um, an important point, namely, um, why would we want to accept Sharia? Um, and it's kind of simple here. Um, we look to the Muslim world. We look to those 47 Muslim countries. There's no place that we'd want to live or that we'd want to imitate in order to make our society better. So whatever problems we have over here in the West, we'd rather deal with them uh, according to the system we have rather than adopting the system of all these countries where people are fleeing in order to get to the West. Um, so if we look to the Muslim world, we don't see any reason to adopt Sharia. If we look to Muhammad's teachings, uh, what he taught about raping captives and having sex with young girls and uh, beating wives into submission and violence against unbelievers and all these things, we don't see anything there that would draw us to them. We don't see anything there. We say, aha, this is beautiful. This is something we want to imitate. So there's nothing in the Muslim world that we would want to copy as far as Sharia goes. And there's nothing in Muhammad's teachings that we would want to imitate. So the question at the end of the day is, is there a reason, is there a reason to believe that Muhammad is a prophet? When, so she offered many criticisms of Muhammad. And I think that is the only route to go. You'll never, you'll never attract people to Sharia by telling what Sharia teaches. And you'll never attract us to Sharia by giving examples of it. Uh, you can only draw people to Sharia by saying, look, whether you like it or not, Islam is true. And here's the proof. And uh, Anjum has said in the past that he's willing to debate that. And I know that Sam and I will be uh, at ABN next month. So if uh, maybe if Anjum wants to uh, get his partner, uh, uh, Sheikh Bakri, um, I'd love to discuss that issue to see whether he's got any other reasons for us to believe in Sharia, namely evidence that Muhammad did come from God, in which case Sharia uh, would be true, whether we like it or not, and even if we find it absolutely repulsive, as I obviously do. Gentlemen, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to go through the 90 minutes here on this live debate on abnsat.com. Again, uh, we appreciate your input, and certainly uh, the debate goes on. You know, this is a live show, but this is a live debate. The, co the questions continue to be active and alive as, 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 the, uh, as the debate continues, not only on this program, but beyond this program and even before this program started. But we're glad that you were both to be, to be a, were part of this uh, program tonight. And thank you for everyone out there for calling in and, and tuning in to tonight's show. Uh, continue to, to uh, support our programming and, and uh, call in and tune in and watch the programs that are coming on. We have our website, again, www.abnsat.com. Continue to pray for us in this ministry here. Continue to support us. Think about us. Continue to be in contact with us. Thank you so much. God bless you for being a part of the show. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next time.